Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I got to tell you, today's topic is going to resonate with so many of you because when Mary Jo uh, submitted her topic, I'm like, where were you 30 years ago when I really needed you? So hi again, I'm Linda Joy. And with me today is Mary Jo Rathgeb. We're going to be talking about money and money fears and stories and beliefs that are sabotaging your abundance and prosperity. And you know, when I first heard about that many years ago, I was like, what are you talking about? This is just how my money story is. I didn't realize there are layers upon layers. And we're going to be talking about that today. Mary Jo Rathgeb is a life transitions coach and certified RIM facilitator, helps clients shine a light on shadow emotions so they can reclaim the energy and wisdom within. Mary Jo holds space for and expertly guides women who are ready to release people-pleasing and perfectionism so they can align their life with their authentic self. She specializes in working with women catalyzed by major life changes who want to navigate it consciously. Welcome, Mary Jo. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for letting me talk about this. <laughs> well, it's such an important topic. And, you know, for those who are, who are not familiar with my story, I was a former welfare mom, queen of self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. I thought that money and abundance and security was for other people, that it was just not meant for me, right? Because I kept repeating the same patterns over and over again. Yeah. And that's why I wanted Mary Jo here because she's such an expert at um, helping women uncover these shadow beliefs and emotions that are running the show in sabotaging our abundance. And now more than ever, we need women to be full in their money story so they can live the life they desire and support their families and community. Mm -hmm. So Mary Jo, thank you for you know being open to dive deep into this topic. Yes. Yeah. It's funny because when I first decided that I was going to give it, there was a moment of like, oh, <laughs> you know, but, you know, the own money shadows kind of come up because, you know, one of the reasons that it's such a emotionally charged topic is because it's taboo. You know, people don't talk about money. You're taught not to talk about it. Right. And so it's, it, shrouded in this sense of like secrecy and you can't talk about it and it's not okay. And, and so that just gives it this like aura um, of like, well, should I feel, how should I feel about it? You know, it's like, and sometimes that leads to like guilt and shame, you know, around your money because you don't really feel free to share it and, um, you know, not share your money. I mean, your feelings around it. <laughs> <laughs> if, that make, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes complete sense because way back then when I was a welfare mom and queen of self-sabotage, we're going back about 30 years. So first 30 years of my life, I couldn't get out of my own way. Mm -hmm. I was a financial misfit. And I had such shame about that, right? Because I had other family members that like rocking it and doing everything right from the time they were 18. And I'm like, is there a secret to this? Like, what is it? Right. For myself, I realize now, I didn't realize it then, I had so much trauma and healing in my life that I had these unconscious scripts that were running the show. And mine, in my case, was worthiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who am I? I don't deserve, right? Right. So why don't we talk about that? Why don't we talk yeah. about some of the emotions about money that we may be consciously or unconsciously um thinking that it is actually sabotaging our abundance capabilities. Yes. Yeah. So, so we'll start at the beginning, which is basically the early years of childhood when your experiences inform your beliefs about money and those inform your emotions about money. <laughs> and then it also informs your thoughts and your behaviors. And so what you can see and know consciously are your behaviors and your thoughts. So those are the, those are the hints, the clues, if you will, about what's going on underneath. Your emotions are the, are the inroad to what's going on underneath. And so it's like when you have those fears and those feelings around um, money, 
those are the those are what's going to take you down to what are the beliefs that are really operating underneath the surface and when you are a child you are beholden to you know your parents or caregivers you are also imprinted um that's how we are made <laughs> you are imprinted with the the belief systems that you're being raised by so funny and, as you were but, speaking, I'm thinking of some of the things I heard growing up. Like, you know yeah. what? Even growing trees, we can only get one box of cereal for the four of you. Next week, you'll get to pick. So yeah. that's a lack energy. Even yeah. though I felt, I thought I felt secure because we were considered middle class, right? Yeah, we're yeah. middle class. But I see now, being on the path I'm on, those mm -hmm. are all the innuendos being embedded from a young age unconsciously of course nobody no Absolutely. does that on purpose yeah is that what you mean about the exactly stuff? that's exactly what I mean and so it's like you know as little children we are sponges and we are taking in all of the information that we can and going back to the idea of money not being talked about right so we are taking in the information and making meaning out of it without necessarily having been taught anything about it or, you know, we're, and we are making meaning from a five-year-old's brain or a three-year-old's brain or, you know, a 10-year-old's brain. And so when you think about that, it's like the perspective is limited. Yeah. And so you don't see the whole picture. You don't understand the whole picture. However, you make meaning out of it and it's unconscious and it becomes a belief system that you start to live by. And so that starts to inform all those behaviors. And so like, you know, the money doesn't grow in trees thing, you know, one of the, one of the um, imprints that I received was a uh, waste, not want not. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my parents were frugal. We were middle class as well. So it wasn't like we were starving, um, you know, we, but there was this, they were paid once a month. And so at the beginning of the month, payday, woohoo, you know, it's like more of a party, you know, and like, yay. And then as the month went on, it was more like, okay, you know, we need to make sure that we stretch this out so that we can get more when the, the new check comes in, if you will. So you felt the energy, even and you, as a child, if you can't rationalize, we, yeah. you tapped into the energy of like, something's changing here. Yes, yes. And even doing all this work um, a couple of years ago, so this is very recent, you know, for me, doing, um, you know, like a live in a deep dive kind of transformational work <laughs> um, with the rim training. And we were living in a house uh, for a couple of weeks together. And I was coming from and we had to share food, you know, the shopping, the cooking and everything. And um, I was coming from the waste, not want not um, mentality. And I didn't realize it until I butted up against someone who was coming from a food insecurity, went to bed hungry as a child and learned I, in order to feel safe, I need an abundance of food mm -hmm. and is feeding a large family. And so we butted heads against each other. And it wasn't until we really sat down and said, what is going on that both of us realized the, the stories that were running behind that. And so it's like, you know, even now, even with doing a lot of personal work and all these things, things still come up. They rise to the surface, um, you know, to be known. And I'm so grateful that you're sharing that because I like to say, like, I've been on this path 30 years and I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. Shit still comes up for me to heal. Yeah. And anyone that says it doesn't, isn't doing their inner work, right? Because we're right. like an onion. We're always peeling back. So thank you for that truth and vulnerability because I think when we can share our truth about our money fears, about mm -hmm. our own experiences, that helps even one woman realize she's not alone. There's nothing wrong with her. No. To be having these doubts and fears. Do mm -hmm. you feel that like there's a permeation and I see it, especially, you know, I have a large audience of women. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, a fear of, well, I see two fears, a fear of I'm never going to be able to get the abundance I desire 
mm-hmm. and or if I get it, I'm not going to be able to keep it. It's like they can't even be grateful for when they get it. Right. Because they're holding on so tight. Can we talk about that? Because I know yeah. that will really serve. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that that goes back to, um, you know, again, the the childhood um, imprinting, if you will, and the the idea of, you know, either not being worthy, um, not being enough, um, not not being deserving. And, and, and it can also lead to, you know, like, not belonging. Yeah. Feeling almost like an Start outsider in your a lot life. Of, hmm? Feeling like an outsider in your yes. life. Yeah, like like if you start suddenly having a, an abundance of money and the people around you don't or your family around you don't, then you could be outcast. You won't belong anymore to that group. And therefore, you may be blocking your receiving of abundance for fear of not, you know, of not belonging. So funny because that, you know, like when you hear truth, you get those little inklings and reminders. Mm-hmm. And as you're speaking about that point about 30 years ago when I got on the path, mm-hmm. I was I would easily attract abundance. Because if you if people that knew me would say I was a master manifester, mm-hmm. even back then, but here's the difference. It's what you just said. I would easily attract it, but something within me. Yeah, I would either give it away, self-sabotage, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a deep wound. That one took the longest for me to heal, to mm. be able to do what I do today and feel abundant and aligned, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a common one of the worthiness? Like even if yes. it comes to them, they they kind of yes. energetically push it away, even though intellectually yes. they're like, what are you doing, Linda? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It is I would say worthiness and um, deservability and and belonging are right up there, <laughs> you know. So it's like if you um, it it also goes to you know if you have the wound of like being too much. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I have a few friends who they identify that way, so mm-hmm. they're always. I think I call it dulling their light. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yet, and and remember that energy uh, that money is an energy, right? Um, and so it's neutral until you put the charge on it, the meaning, the meaning making around it. And so if when you are trying to receive money, but you're blocking it because you don't feel you deserve it, you don't feel you're worthy, or you feel like somehow having it is going to make you stop belonging, um, or People will start judging you for being too much. Who is she? You know, she's too big for her britches kind of thing. Um, You know, then you will unconsciously block it. And I'm glad you said unconsciously, because as we're Mm -hmm. speaking, ladies, I really want you to think about, and we're going to talk about it in a moment, what your relationship with money is. Because if you asked me back then, I was not pushing away money. I Mm -hmm. wanted it. But within me, within my own energy being, there was a pushing away but yes. of course if we don't know that language or have um experts like Mary Jo here to help us we will continue that pattern mm-hmm. yeah. I suffered and um, sabotaged myself for a long time because I wasn't willing to do the work to look at the patterns mm. why don't we talk about that because yeah. we all have a relationship to money and mm-hmm. and uh, it all it has a role in each of our lives that may look different right. so can you talk about that a little I guess, sure. And I, I mean, I can share a personal story, um, you know, if if that. If of that, course, I love uh, stories. I believe they really touch yeah. the soul of a situation. Yeah. So um, I'm sure that many people in this um, audience who are listening have heard the um, the exercise about like if money were a person or a character, let's say, who would it be? And that's one way of getting to understand your relationship with money is by playing that game. And I recently did that because I had another money, you know, like uh, flare up and I played that game with myself and, and actually money turned out to be Mr. Monocle, you know, the little Monopoly guy (laughs) with the top hat and the tuxedo on. (laughs) And, um, and, and it turns out that my current relationship with money is seeing it as a bit of a game. 
And it's a game, Monopoly is a game that I sometimes play well, but not always. And um, my late husband, and it actually is the 15 year anniversary today when we're taping um, of his death. Um, he was a financial person, you know, hedge fund guy, really great with money. And I would play Monopoly with him and he would change the rules of the game. And suddenly I would be, he would be my banker that I have now like <laughs> started. Um, he's like keeping me in the game by like giving me money um, and lending it to me. And he's like changing all the rules. And, and it was like, whoa. And, <laughs> and so I tell that story because I realized that um, it actually ties back to um, uh, uh, an experience that I had when I was probably about 10. And um, we had a county fair that came through every summer, the last week of summer. And that was like the big highlight. And um, our parents had worked out a system where in addition to our allowance, we would earn money by doing chores around the house and literally working for like a penny, a nickel, a dime, you know? And I worked all summer and earned $20. For the fair and I spent it all that I worked in like 20 minutes and so I was just like in tears I was crying um, because I had worked so hard for this money and it was gone I spent it immediately and then what happened was my mother gave me another 20 to calm me down so that I could still have fun and, um, you know, continue and carry on at the fair. And what I learned is that there's a part of me that believes I need to work hard, possibly for pennies and nickels and dimes. And then there's another part of me that expects a windfall. Yeah, I can, I can relate to this. <laughs> it's like this, um, this nuance is like always playing between the two energies. Yes. So you want to come into balance. Right. Between the two, right? Yes. And so then the new game, if you will, is that I can set the rules and that I don't have to work for pennies or nickels or dimes. Mm -hmm. You know, I can work for the amount that feels aligned, you know, and my worth or value. And I can still get the windfall. And they can be. Yeah, it's not an or. In other words, it's an and. It's an and. It's not an or. It's an and. Right. That was a, per a perfect example of like the, the the inner fight within us when it comes to money, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm feeling abundant. I think I'll buy myself a blow. She'd come home and like, oh my god, I should return this blow. I can't believe I spent that money. <laughs> Right. I, and ladies, right. I know you know what I mean when you come home with all the shoes and you're like, what did you do? Yeah. It's this dance. <clears throat> And is. I know you do a lot of work. A lot of the core foundation of your work is helping a woman get to the shadow emotions and beliefs yes. that are blocking yeah. them, not just in abundance, because you you work across all realms, but for the sake of this conversation. Yeah. Um, so what are the main blocks? You named a couple, worthiness, deservedness, mm -hmm. any other um, in the scripts of childhood, any right. other blocks or false beliefs that are hidden in the shadows that you see? Well, Besides not enoughness is probably the biggest, you know, yeah. I am not enough. Um, another one that is a big block that may not make sense right away or seem like it makes sense is I am alone. I am alone. Mm-hmm. So alone in the world, like meaning like, like I have to fight. Responses. Yeah, like I have to fight for everything. I don't have support. I don't know how to ask for support. I don't know how to receive support. Um, and in that can also mean don't know how to receive the monetary support as well, not just other people's support. I think that was one of mine because as you're saying it, it's resonating with truth, but I wouldn't have known to use the words, I am alone. Mm -hmm. Mine came down to the ability to receive, which then of course was tied to worthiness. And mm -hmm. it's so funny. It's almost like, and I'm sure you see this with your work when you're working with women and befriending their shadow emotions, 
Mm-hmm. So you start to pull the little thread that you know is there. Mm-hmm. And yep. you find other shadow beliefs mm-hmm. that are connected to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and what what I would say is um, the shadow beliefs are the symptom. They're not the problem. The problem is in the avoiding them or the repressing them or the, you know, negating, the denying them. That's the problem. Having them is not the problem. What a great insight, because I used to be the one that would try to hold everything in. Like, I don't want to deal with that, especially money issues, right? I don't want to deal with that. It took me more energy to hold that ball underwater than it did to finally turn and face it. And you and I have had conversations in the past, and we talked about that. Mm -hmm. So. I'm really curious in our last segment, I'd love to talk about Mm -hmm. how a couple tips or strategies of how a listener can start to befriend her shadow emotions, especially Mm -hmm. around money. Mm -hmm. So first, I would say you use the word turn toward, turn toward, Um, and then get to know, (laughs) get to understand. And so when uh, let me put it to you this way, your your um, fears and your shadow emotions, if you understood that they were a part of you that is young and scared or has some kind of limited perception about the world and they're freaking out, would you? avoid them? Would you turn, push them away? Would you say, shut up? (laughs) You know, we're trying to live a life here. It's a great way of looking at it because we wouldn't do that, would we? No, no. And so, and so, you know, one of the practices that's very easy to get in touch with, you know, what's going on under the under, (laughs) if you will, is, you know, like, is the practice of like active dialogue where you sit down with a journal and uh, you know pen and paper and just get in touch with that with that fear um, that you're feeling or that emotion that you're feeling and just ask it you know how old are you and let that answer come up and then you can ask them you know what do you want to be called what's your name you know, what, and get to know the part of you that has that fear. And then you can ask them, you know, when were you created? And then what's your role? What are you trying to protect me from? And then finally, what do you need? Ooh. And once you have that information, you can reassure that part that life is not the way they, you know, they think it is anymore. You know, you're an adult and you're not going to leave them behind. You're not going to put them in a corner. You're not going to put the dunce cap on them, (laughs) shame them, you know, put them back in the closet, whatever it is. They get a seat in the car. It's just not the driver's seat. It's passenger seat. And they can still you know, they can still have their needs, but you listen to what those needs are. And then you, you say, okay, we'll address that as an adult. And I'm so visual. And when you said, um, well, hello, fear, you're going in the passenger seat, right? Because unbeknownst to any of us right now, fear is driving the car, isn't it? Yeah. Making every decision. So when you said that, because I'm so visual, I could see like, okay, you can come for the ride, but you're not my navigator anymore. Right. That just energetically just really resonated with my heart in my own belief system of, mm. because right now you'll get, a lot of us are giving the keys to our fear. Yes. Right. And wondering why. So that was, I, that was a beautiful example. I know resonated with me as I'm sure it will with so many. Mm-hmm. Something else you said about that little child. So having this journaling dialogue Um, I think is powerful because again, being visual, I could see 
it's now that little child that's taking the temper tantrum yelling and screaming because it wants to be heard is now like oh she's listening to me and I could almost energetically see the energy of yeah I call I used to call my negative Nelly Mm-hmm. Yeah. So okay. you're negative Nellie. How old is she? <laughs> oh, she's about four and she can take okay. the tantrums. Yeah. But energetically, I could see as you were speaking and, and dialoguing with her getting smaller and smaller. And that's what the journaling process is for, right? To to quiet that voice so that our true self can lead the way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's powerful. And I know you do a you are such a um, extraordinary healer, leader, et cetera. And I know you're a certified RIM facilitator, life transitions coach. You have many other certifications. I'm really curious. Do a lot of women come to you for the shadow work related to money? Um, and what's the second category they might come? Is it relationship, self-worth? Because they're all really tied, aren't they? Yeah, they're really tied. Um, I, I actually, I would say it's the um, the I am alone belief. Wow. Do they feel alone, like in the world itself, like kind of feeling disconnected from the energy of the world, or in their own community, or their family, or all of the above? No, it, it's it's about feeling um, that they have to do it themselves. Oh, <laughs> I used to call that superwoman syndrome. I <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And my mother would always say to me, I can remember as a teen and 20, she goes, you know, Linda, you can ask for help sometimes. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> you know? Right, right. I'm teen. But now, in all the work I do with women, my number one message is come together in a circle of collaboration. You do not need to do it alone. Don't do what right. I did. Is, right. so that's the energy I am alone feels like. Yes. Okay. Now yeah. that really resonates with me. And as it, I'm sure it does so many women that I am alone is I've got this nose to the grindstone, got to work hard. I can't ask for help. Can't be vulnerable. Oh, right. 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 And, and, but ironically, if people, you know, if a woman is going through a big enough and important enough life transition and those fears come up and, and they will um, mostly manifest as a money fear. Um, then they'll reach out for help. But they wait till it's at crisis point, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and they also know that the money fear is not the thing. So they know, they understand there's a deeper level. Yeah, of they understand. I, I know how to make money. You know, it's like, it's not about that, but I don't know what it's about. And so I know I need to get support. Yeah, what a gift, what a gift of the work you're doing in the world, because it wasn't until I got to the underneath, like stop living on the shallow edge of all my thoughts and beliefs. And I don't mean that in a negative connotation, but that's how I was living. Like, I don't want to look underneath the hood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I was really like, even the word shadow beliefs, it was like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. yeah. But that is where truth is. That's where healing is. That's where yes. our wounded little child is. And if it takes more energy to avoid it mm-hmm. and take it from me, ladies, because I tried to avoid looking at it all. My healing couldn't come until I did. And that's why I really um, want to marry Joe here for this whole event, uh, this whole conversation. She'll be writing some articles for Aspire too. She doesn't know <laughs> yet. <laughs> so um <laughs> And um, I'm honored to share her story in the upcoming Life Shifts book. But this topic in particular, I see so many women in my community really struggling with this and don't know why they're struggling. But they're trying to intellectualize their healing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did too. I think we've all done that. It's to avoid the feelings and emotions Mm -hmm. of going within. And I'm sure you see that a lot too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that's how, you know, we're, that we're trained to be rational thinkers, right? And, you know, everyone believes that, you know, your thinking brain is the, you know, most powerful part of you, but it's actually not true. <laughs> you know, um, your thinking brain is more like 20% and your feeling, um, your feeling body is 80%. And so it's much more powerful. To give you another visual, you know how you talked about living on the surface? 
Yeah. Um, one of the, the visuals that I learned in RIM, um, in learning RIM, is that the surface, you can see about, let's say, three feet deep, you know, maybe six feet deep. And when you look down into that, it looks dark and murky and scary. And you can see, you know, like, snakes or you know weeds or whatever it is creepy things and it's like blah, and you don't want to go in but what you don't see is that just below that three to six foot depth if you dive deeper that's where the healing is that's where the support is that's where the resources are and you have resources tucked away locked away that you have suppressed underneath that muck that you don't have access to when you're not willing to go deep. The highest version of ourselves is yes. under the muck. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful, that is powerful. And I have loved this whole conversation. <laughs> I'm so honored that you joined me because I know so many are gonna be served. And for everyone listening, I really invite you, Mary Jo, right on the side of this video, you'll see claim your free gift, just click that. This is a gift you wanna give yourself right? And it's called five reasons to befriend your shadow emotions. It's an e-guide. And if you were like me and had any trepidation about, ooh, I don't want to work with my shadows, please, if you trust me, if you love me, um, you've watched, you've witnessed my life, if you've been in this um, community for a long time, trust me and get this. Because it is, it's exactly what she said, under the muck, of all the stuff you're trying to avoid is your light, is your abundance, is your truth, is your um, is your sense of inner peace. That's what was waiting for me under the muck. And I wasted too many, I want to say years, but I'll be honest, decades <laughs> avoiding the muck. So in this free e-guide, um, if you find yourself repeating the same old patterns over and over again, like I used to, and you know you want to change it, then get this guide um, because it's time you try something different. You with me on this? Are you tired of doing the same thing over and over again? So our shadows are not all negative. They're also filled with the gifts that Mary Jo and myself were just talking about. And they're stuffed along with everything we've avoided. So they're kind of like stuck in the muck down there waiting for you to come dive down and, and release them. So in this e-guide, you will learn the transformative power of befriending your emotions, shadow emotions, and I got to tell you something, when you get the e-guide and you open it up, there's going to be a bonus that I can't believe Mary Jo is offering. So I'm not going to tell you anymore. So get the e-guide, um, stay connected with Mary Jo. She has some amazing offerings coming up, lots of wisdom to share. And Mary Jo, thank you. Thank you for the sacred offering and this conversation, my friend. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Blessings, everyone.